pick up uh, basically where we left off. Um, I had talked about, uh, I believe, Harding's, like some of his good and some of his bad. I don't know if we talked about the Ohio gang yet. Oops. Okay, yeah, so that's just the last lines there, the Ohio gang. And um, with that, uh, it's just like with any president. So, like, um, when Obama went to Washington, D.C., he took with him a lot of people from Chicago. When George W. Bush went, a lot of people from Texas. People that you surround yourself with, you know, where you live and work, and you bring those people with you. Sometimes you reward your friends with good jobs. Politics, this happens a lot, okay? And so you got to be careful about who you put in charge of your administration, you know, who you got working for you. If you got competent people, hopefully they do a good job. If you have incompetent people or people that are trying to get rich themselves, it's going to come back and haunt you as the president, okay? So, um, these are the types of things they were drinking alcohol in the White House, which was illegal. Uh, you know, sitting around smoking cigars, playing cards. Um, like Fall used his office to enrich himself. And so the media calling his cabinet the Ohio gang. Okay. So kind of a negative uh, connotation there. Okay. And we'll come back to that later. Um, because in 1932, I'll just go ahead and spoil it. The media starts to call Roosevelt's cabinet. Anybody who know what they call that? The Brain Trust. Okay, so you have the Ohio gang, Brain Trust. Okay, so I wonder which administration the media liked more. It's kind of hard to figure out, right? So, um, yeah, so this, this, now we're not, Killing off Harding yet, but um, I told you how he died. Yeah, like, did you just get that from the video? Okay, yeah, so like, he was in San Francisco and uh, was really, he was sick. He had walking pneumonia, uh, was overworking himself, really trying to deflect a lot of this stuff. And um, after a long day, went up a big flight of stairs, went into his hotel room, collapsed on the bed and died. So they did an autopsy um, and it showed President Harding had an enlarged heart. And I think the video mentioned that. Did they mention how they brought the body back across by railroad? They, for the, they were in San Francisco and it's something like nine million people lined the railroad tracks as it was coming through their cities to pay the respects to the, the deceased president. Okay. So I mean he wasn't uh, he wasn't hugely popular. I mean, obviously he won the election, so people liked him. Um, but some of these scandals kind of took its toll on his reputation and so forth. And historians love to bash on him. So um, he really wasn't a bad guy. It's just really the people that were around him. Now, he was a conservative. Um, so one of the striking things I saw in the video uh, yesterday with you guys was when they talked about... Oh, oh, the, uh, the Mississippi flood of 1927, yeah. right? Uh, and they said how Coolidge said, this is not the job of the federal government to you know help these people bail them out and that sort of thing. That's the job of charity, state governments, and so forth, okay? And it really shows you just how much as a nation we've changed as far as the role of the federal government. So like in government class next semester, you'll learn about the Constitution and the limits of, on power that the government has, the federal government. And um, so in this time period, if you were really, if you were a conservative, really government wasn't gonna do much. So as far as uh, planning national policy, the federal government just didn't do that much back then. Today, they're way, go way beyond what they did back then. Okay. So you have the post office, which was the federal government. You had the armed forces, which was the federal government. Other than that, they didn't do a lot, okay? All right, so moving on, we're going to do uh, some foreign policy and some domestic policy with uh, Harding, okay? 
And the last thing we talked about foreign policy wise really was World War One. Okay, and so that's going to leave a bad taste in people's mouths, no pun intended. Yes. Um, so this is a this is a treaty. Yeah, we're going to have a series of treaties and pacts after the war to try and prevent the war another war like this from happening again. Make sense? Okay. Now. This one here called the Five Power Treaty, there's the Nine Power Treaty, there's the kellogg briand Pact that we'll talk about a little bit later, okay? This one here in particular is what's called a disarmament treaty. The idea here is if we disarm, get rid of our weapons, or at least some of our weapons, we'll be less likely to go to war if people have fewer weapons. So in this case, it's going to be navies. So large capital ships that uh, over 10,000 tons of displacement, these warships, big destroyers, battleships, limit the number of these. Okay, and then we'd be less likely to go to war. That's the idea. Now, some historians refer to this as a successful disarmament treaty. Uh, the 1920s guys are relatively peaceful. There's, I mean, there's no major wars in the 1920s. You have revolution in Russia, okay, uh, but that's over by 1922, okay. So, um, is the reason why we don't have any major wars because of disarmament treaties or other pacts and so forth? Or is there the reason we don't have another war because nobody wanted to do that again? So you can't really quantify the success of this or not, okay? But I'm just going to go ahead and be a spoiler and tell you, one of these five countries, U.S., Great Britain, Britain France, Italy, or Japan, is going to violate this treaty in 1925. So this is signed roughly about 1920. Now, if you had to pick one of those up there that's going to violate this treaty, who would you guess? U.S. U.S., Japan, Italy. The one least likely up there you would think that would violate this. France. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be the French, guys. And here's the reason why. In 1922, Italy's going to get a new leader. He's a fascist. He's a thug. His name is Benito Mussolini. Okay. In fact, guys, he's the first fascist. He coins the term fascist. Okay. So what does Mussolini want to do? Well, he keeps telling his people he wants to build a new Roman Empire. Hmm. Okay. If you study history, and you guys have, and you think about the size and scope of the Roman Empire, right? Was France at any time part of the Roman Empire included in that geography? Yes. Yes. So if you're France and you got this neighbor to your south that's talking about building a new Roman Empire, is now the time to reduce the size of your arms? In the eyes of the French, no. <laughs> and I, you, you kind of got to give the French some credit here for using common sense. Okay. Now, I don't give the French credit very often. Okay. So <laughs> pay attention because that's about it. All right. Now, uh, yeah. So, and now eventually uh, Japan will violate this as well. But the thing about this, guys, this treaty, it's a piece of paper. Okay. Now, nothing in the treaty says, okay. France, if you violate this treaty, we are going to put economic sanctions on you, where we won't let anybody around you trade with you. That's not in there. If you violate this treaty, the other four are going to go to war with you and stop you. Wait a second. What are we trying to prevent in the first place? War, conflict between nations. This is a piece of paper. That's it. There's no backbone to it. Now, listen, we've signed dozens and dozens of treaties in this nation's history, okay? But without any backbone to it, 
They mean nothing. So you can make an agreement with North Korea and say, hey, North Korea, you're going to stop your nuclear program. Iran, you're going to stop your nuclear program. Now, with no ability to check on them or watch them or have repercussions for violating that, what good is it? It might make you feel warm and fuzzy inside to think that you did something brilliant and made a treaty. Okay? But let's not be childish. Let's not be naive. Okay? There is evil in the, in the world. Okay? And people are going to act up. You're either going to be weak or you're going to be strong. Okay? And so this is just, just kind of touching off the making this is one of the examples of several treaties that we'll be talking about. So, as I have in the notes here, does this actually provide for a decade of peace? I don't think you can give this treaty all the credit, okay? Um, but there is no way to enforce this, uh, short of conflict, which is what we're trying to avoid, okay? Now, we gotta, we're going to check in with Japan now. Like, every so often, I'll throw something in there about Japan, okay? So, to remember our immigration... Uh, which was called the, uh, what was the name of that act? It's called the National Origins Act of 1924. What kind of immigration did we have with Asia? Zero, right. So our relations with Japan at this point in time are not really good, okay? They are starting to industrialize. Japan is, okay? And one thing you got to always remember about Japan, guys, is it's an island. So they have limited what? Yeah, natural resources. When you industrialize, you need those resources. One way to get those resources is to take them by force. All right, so that's a little bit of foreign affairs there, guys. Um, we'll be doing some more shortly. Okay. We're going to move over to domestic policy with uh, Harding. Okay. And as I said before, he's a conservative. Now, we are going to be in a depression. It's a small and it's a short depression. And I think they mentioned that in the video. Okay. And how Harding addresses this depression is going to be different than the way we deal with recessions and depressions today, really since the Great Depression. So the last 70 years, we've acted differently than Harding's going to act here, 100 years ago. Okay, you ready? We good? Okay. So this is, uh, Harding calls a special session of Congress after taking office. Now, Harding takes office on March 4th. Okay, we're going to later change our date of inauguration to January 20th. You guys know what amendment that is? The lame duck amendment, what number that is? 20. Okay. Yeah, so he'll, he'll take off March 4th, and April of 21, he calls a special session. Excuse me. And these are the four major points of Harding's domestic policy that he wants to see get through. Now, Wilson was a Democrat. He was a progressive. So we had eight years of Wilson, and Harding's wanting to kind of switch things around here to a more conservative approach. So if you look at these things, especially number two and three, this is really typical of what political party? The Republican Party, okay? So that's in line there, okay? Now, the whole tariff thing is really interesting. And um, it got a lot more interesting in 2016 when Trump was elected, okay, when we start talking about tariffs. Remember, I've been teaching this class for 20-plus years, okay? So in this case, guys, in the 1920s going into the 30s, tariffs are disastrous for the United States, okay? And so when I start teaching that and then Trump comes in and not only talks about doing tariffs, but actually implements them, okay? It's something that, okay, I don't know. This, look what happened back in, back here, okay? But let me give you some examples here in recent memory, 
So when Obama was elected, one of the things that was going on at the time is the Chinese were dumping uh, cheap rubber tires on the U.S. market, okay, that you could buy a lot cheaper than, you know, fire stones made, made in the U.S., okay? And, um, guys, tires are important for safe, driving safety. You know, if you have good tires, it helps to control your vehicle. Okay. If you have bad tires, it can lead to bad things, blowouts, you know, uh, not being able to stop properly or accelerate properly and so forth. So anyhow, uh, Obama talked about putting tariffs on Chinese tires. He got into office, asked Congress to do it. You know what Congress said? No. I can remember George W. Bush when he was in office, and he said, we're going to put um, – we're going to put tariffs on foreign steel, imported steel, cheap steel coming into the United States. Because, guys, U.S. steel used to be like the backbone of our economy, okay? And it was decimated in the 1980s, 90s. Actually, yeah, for many years it's been decimated. And so the idea was put tariffs on steel so that we could make steel here and compete, okay? Now, I should have said something first. Everybody knows what a tariff is. The tax on imports. Now, guys, how tariffs work is it's a tax on the consumer. Okay, the, the person that's importing the stuff or exporting it to the U.S., they don't pay it. Our government doesn't pay it. The consumer pays it in the cost of higher prices for foreign goods. Okay, everybody with me? All right. And so Trump gets in office and he's like, look, China, we have a five- Hundred billion dollar trade deficit with China, which means we buy five hundred billion dollars more in Chinese goods than they buy of American goods. Whether it's food or cigarettes or automobiles, China has one billion more people than we do. We have 0.3, they have 1.3 billion. Now, if they would buy more of our stuff, then we'd have a better trade in balance, yes? And they have more people, so it makes sense they could buy more of our stuff, right? And that's what Trump was saying. Because, guys, you and I, your parents and you and I, we built the Chinese economy over the last 30 years. As consumers, we built their economy. Our government said to our businesses, you can leave Detroit. You can leave Yorktown, Ohio, and you can set up manufacturing in China or Vietnam or in uh, Mexico or Dominican Republic or Nicaragua or Taiwan. You can set up shop over there. Hey, what kind of, why, why, do, why, would people, why would our businesses want to do that? Cheap labor. Bigger profit margin. What happens to those jobs in America? Guys, this part of the United States, New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan. Guys, this was where the industry was. Today, they refer to this area as the Rust Belt. Because all those factories, all those industries have shut down and they're rusting. And so when you look at population movements over the last 30 years, people are leaving these states and fleeing to other states where they can find jobs. And the taxes on us are gone high. Okay? And that is a direct result of our trade policies with China and other countries. Now, the nice thing is, ladies and gentlemen, is you can go to Walmart and buy cheap crap. And if it breaks, it's so cheap, you don't get it fixed. You just throw it away and buy another one. Cheap consumer goods. Whether it's, you know, screen, you know, computer screens, computers. Refrigerators, I don't know. We make those here. 
I don't make them like they used to. <laughs> you guys have an ice machine that quit working? I have twice, the last two refrigerators. Okay. Um, so anyhow, what am I talking about? Talking about tariffs, okay? Now, before I get, uh, I kind of got into tariffs, and I didn't mean to skip this. And So let me hit this real quick, and then I'll come back to tariffs. And actually, I'm going to do an example with you, okay? Walk you through. Because tariffs are going to be something you're going to have to write about on the text. All right, this is kind of interesting, although not super interesting. Um, guys, and prior to the Harding administration, if the U.S. Congress wanted to build a new Navy ship, somebody in Congress would propose a bill to build a new ship. This is how much it's going to cost. This is where we're going to build it, okay? We're going to call it the USS Wichita. Congress would vote on that bill. If they wanted to build a bridge, they would vote on that bill. If they wanted to extend a highway, they would vote on that bill. This was changed during the Harding administration when they created the Bureau of Budget. So instead of individually passing spending bills, they just throw everything into one budget and pass one bill. Anybody see anything like what could happen with this? We start doing it this way. The budget what? You could see that. You could see fights over the budget. Do you think members of Congress can like kind of like sneak stuff in there? Spend a lot of money, like get little projects for their home state. Maybe wasteful spending. Now, there's a term for that in Washington, D.C., wasteful spending. It's called pork or pork barrel spending. Have you heard that term before, pork barrel spending? It's wasteful government spending, pork fat, you know. Um, there's a congressman out of Oklahoma that puts together a list every year, the, the worst pork barrel spending that happened the previous year. Okay. And you look at it and you're like, geez, like the hundred thousand, one hundred fifty thousand dollars to study the mating habits of the Japanese quail. Okay. That's our tax dollar money. And somebody's going to get a grant for one hundred fifty thousand dollars to study that. The mating habits of the Japanese quail. Okay, now that might be important to some people, but is that what we should be spending our tax dollars on? Especially when we're in debt, right? So you see a lot of this kind of stuff get stuck in the legislation. And by not passing each individual bill, because if that came up, $150,000 on the floor, just that bill, there's a good chance it wouldn't have passed. But if it's stuck in a big budget with now trillions of dollars, nobody barely notices. Because the budget is like 3,000 pages long, and nobody reads it. Very few read it. Out of the staff. Huh? It's great people who go to uh, Staff that read it, but the members don't. Very few. Yeah, you could have that job. You could go get a job working for a member of Congress, and you could say, hey, I need you to read this over the weekend. Voting on it on Monday. 2,600 pages. All right, then the General Accounting Office, guys, um, is still around today, GAO. Um, and they just try and make sure that when government spends money, it does it legally, follows the law, and then uh, recommends uh, more efficient ways, hopefully, to spend that money, more effective ways, use of money, and so forth. Okay, so they're still around today. Um, those aren't going to be on the test. I just there's a lot of information to cover, and that was one that people always missed, and I just so I took it off. All right, back to tariffs. Okay, so these Canadian people up north of us, they really figured out how to grow wheat 
You know, it's a cold climate, but during those warmer months, they got good at growing wheat. Now, people in Canada, guys, there's not a lot of them, yes? But they have a lot of space to grow wheat. So they produce all this wheat, and they have plenty left over to sell on Americans' markets. America's markets. Okay? So what happens to the price of American wheat if the Canadians send in a bunch of cheap wheat in our country? It goes down. Guys, farming is one of those industries that there's really a catch-22. If you have a bumper crop of wheat and just a lot of wheat all over the country, what happens to the price? It goes down because you have a massive amount of supply. If you have a bad crop of wheat, what happens to the price? goes up because there's not enough, there's not as much wheat to sell. But you don't have as much wheat to sell either because you didn't have a good crop. See the catch-22. So when the Canadians figured out how to, you know, grow more and more food, um, our government decided to put a 28% tariff. Okay, so when the Canadians sell their wheat on American markets, it's marked up 28%. So if you're buying that wheat, say you're uh, Sarah Lee, they make bread, right? Wonder Bread, Sarah Lee. If you're one of those companies that needs a lot of wheat, um, you're going to try and find the, the cheapest price wheat you can find. And that 28% tariff is going to make American wheat cheaper than the Canadian. So our people can sell their wheat. It's protectionism. We're protecting American farmers. And then we go further. Coordinate McCumber Act gives industrialists, people that are producing other goods. Now, you, that was one of the cool parts of the movie yesterday, right? Like when they showed the kitchen, you know, and you had, you know, the stove, the oven, you had the, wash, uh, the washing machine and other, other things, toaster ovens, vacuum cleaners. Guys, we're producing this stuff by the millions. And we like to sell some of that stuff overseas, too. Okay? And then other countries are making stuff, and they're sending it into the U.S., and they may have cheaper labor. They might be able to sell it cheaper. They don't have, you know. So uh, what this, this is going to have a negative effect, Okay? Grace, will you take a look at your shoe and tell me where it was made? You can slip them off. Take a look. Indonesia, okay. Indonesia. Indo wow. Hey, come on. What do you got? Made in China. China? Where are your brooks made? China? Vietnam. Vietnam? China? China? Okay. So, second hour, I had a couple Dominican republics that were making sperries. Um, Vietnam and China, um, and then sixth hour the other day I had, or it was fifth hour, we had uh, one from Nicaragua, okay, so um, guys, let me just kind of explain this, um, as, it, as it affects the economy, <laughs> you know what this is? America. That's the USA. Yeah. End of the breed. And Texas. And Great Britain. Great Britain. Thank you. That's the USA. Okay. And then the capital, London. Okay. All right. I'm going to do a little bit of a hypothetical to try to explain how. Tariffs are going to clog trade, and it's really important because um, uh, it, it impacts us really more because we're 
there's such a consumer culture. Okay, so um, let's say for the sake of argument, those Sperry's that many of you are wearing uh, are made in London. Okay, there's a big Sperry factory. Okay, is that spelled right? In London, okay? And they sell shoes in America, big time. Now, what we classify those Sperry's as is casual dress shoes. Okay, and um, let me, if you don't mind me asking, how much did you pay? 90? 45? You got to shop where she shops. Yeah. 50? Free? Remember? 70? Okay. Let's, let's just throw, uh, on average, a Sperry shoe is selling in the United States for. $65, okay, $65, $75, okay? Now, there's a company out in Nebraska. Called New Balance, okay? This is hypothetical. And New Balance, what kind of shoes do they make? Tennis shoes, yeah? Like walking shoes, right? You're, are you wearing? No, you got boots on. Okay. Um, yeah, tennis shoes. They don't make casual dress shoes, do they? But they want to get into the market. They say, like, look at all these shoes these people are wearing. We need to get in on that. Now, the only way New Balance can make these shoes that are quality in the United States, they got to pay American labor and good quality leather. So for them to make a profit, New Balance needs to sell its shoes for $70 a piece, a pair. And so the government says, well, let's help out New Balance, okay? So they're going to put a tariff on these ferries and raise the price to $85 a pair. Now, some of you, especially the free ones, have been priced out of the market. You're like, I'm not spending 85 bucks on a pair of spares. Okay, so what's going to happen to sales of spares in the United States? Okay, what happens at the factory back in London? Yeah, we're going to have to lay some people off. Maybe cut wages. Okay, so there's people with less money in London to buy Sperry's or anything else. Yeah. What happens to the extra 20 bucks? It goes to the Sperry's. They just have to charge more for the goods. They cannot undercut our prices. You see what I mean? So we make them charge more for their goods in our country. How can we do that? Pass a law. Wait. I when it the comes, government we to pass force them to oh, charge more. They're, yeah. If they're selling in America, it has to be. It's regulated by our law. Even though it's their product, it's. We pay it. If we want to buy Sperry's, we pay them. Um, as far as, are you thinking that the U.S. government gets $20? Yes. Yeah. Is that how it works? Is that how it works? I, I don't know. It, it sounds reasonable. Yeah, it sounds I, don't, I feel like that's that really a really underhanded way. Yeah, I, but then what happens? You don't know. But then we get uh, Somebody want to look it up? Look it up and report to me. You can use your phones. Okay. While you're doing that, stay with me. While you're doing that, stay with me. Okay. So if they lay people off here in London, right, the, the economy starts to struggle a little bit in London because of these tariffs. Now, there's a company out in Silicon Valley, California, called Dell. What does Dell make? Computers. Computer. And I don't know if you guys knew this, but people in London, Love Dell computers. Okay? Now, you have fewer people in London to buy Dell computers because of our tariffs. Follow me? You're not following me. That last sentence you said did not make sense. Okay. Since people are making less money in London, yeah. Dell is going to have a hard time selling computers here because they have less money to buy goods. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Goes to the U.S. Treasury. Okay, so the government's going to keep that. You were right. Okay. 
Okay. Now, but still, it is the consumer that is paying. Okay. Now, so if Dell cannot sell as many computers to London as it used to, what happens that back at the factory in Dell? They also have to lay off people, which means there's fewer people to buy New Balance or spin receivers or Dell computers. We are a consumer-driven country, whether we like it or not. We're a materialistic society. If consumers stop spending in this country, our economy suffers. When people spend money, people make money. See, we are generally a service-driven society today. So like most of the jobs that you guys will have will be in the service industry, helping somebody else do something, whether it's in sales, uh, repairing stuff, um, engineering is, is a service, but you're not manufacturing anything. You're not building anything unless you're a builder. Okay. Build houses, you work in the, in the aircraft industry, you're building, okay? But our industry is not what it used to be. We've exported most of that industry, okay? So you'll work in the service industry. So if people are not spending money, they're not using services. And our economy will struggle, okay? So we're still a consumer-driven economy. So this is how tariffs tend to clog trade. In addition to that, what are the Europeans going to do? They're going to retaliate with higher tariffs on our goods, which means we're going to have more trouble selling too. And so it, it, it's a bad cycle. Okay, so when Trump comes in and says, hey, we're going to put uh, tariffs on Chinese goods, this scares a lot of people. Okay, but as I just explained to you, if we do that, maybe it scares the Chinese or convinces the Chinese to buy more of our stuff. And then we'll take away the tariffs because of the $500 billion trade deficit between the two countries. Okay, We've been making China rich. It's time for them to buy some of our stuff. You understand? And that was Trump's thing. We didn't get to find out. So our biggest export to the world from the United States is food, right? And so uh, China had agreed to ramp up the amount of food they were going to buy a lot, okay? Then the freaking pandemic hit. So, and where did the pandemic come from? And who did Trump blame? Okay, so... Now, temporarily, one of the things Trump had to do, because while we were putting tariffs on their stuff before we came to an agreement with the Chinese, they started buying less of our stuff because they were pissed we were putting tariffs on, right? So that really hurt our farmers. So Trump was making payments from the Treasury to farmers to help them in the meantime till we won the negotiation, okay? And it looked like Trump had, had done it. You know what I mean? Like he had stood up to the Chinese and said, look, you need to buy more of our food and more of our stuff. Okay. That Trump's gone. And so is that. Now, I don't know if the Chinese will hold true to what they said they would buy from our farmers. I don't know. Okay. But I would not be surprised to see Biden remove the tariffs from China. Okay. It's not a real popular policy, and that's because of this, of what we saw happen in history. Okay, because this this is going to be one of the causes of the Great Depression, these tariffs. Because it's gonna we're gonna start with this and just keep adding more and more tariffs as the 20s go through. Okay. So hopefully you can understand that. So if I ask you on the test to explain how tariffs can clog the flow of trade. One way to put that is to say that, you know, Europeans needed to be able to sell products here so that they could make money to afford buying our products that we have. And by cutting or putting those tariffs in, we made it harder for 
our trading partners to sell here, therefore harder to buy our goods. Does that make sense? Cool? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was really torn on this because, you know, I have friends, you know, that are Trump supporters and, uh, you know, I, I was favorable to some of Trump's policies and um, this one I had to take a really hard look at and talk to some people about it and just kind of get a feel for it. Um, you know, because we're supposed to learn from history, you know. So when I first heard this, I'm like, I don't know, this could be bad. They could retaliate. But, dude, are we just going to keep doing the same thing with them? Letting the letting them get away with huge trade imbalances? Or are we going to stand up to them? Like I said, they have a billion more people than us. Maybe they should buy more of our stuff. We're going to buy all their stuff. I don't know how you guys feel about it. Which would you rather have? I mean, this is a great question, right? So do you, do you favor protectionism, which is tariffs, protecting our industries, allowing for American businesses to stay in America and hire American employees and pay good wages? That means the products that you and I use will be more expensive. How much would it cost to buy one of these if it was made in America? So what is it now, like 800 bucks? So what do you think? Double? Not double? One of the things they do in China with building these, like, I mean, so like all the different materials that go into this, so they built up the infrastructure around that to get the critical materials in and so forth. And that's one thing we're learning about right now about these critical materials, guys. We're having a shortage. The chips for automobiles, right? You heard about this? Okay, so like our, our auto manufacturers uh, don't have enough chips to put in cars, so they've built the cars. They have no chips, computer chips. We're still waiting. Okay, okay what can we do as a government or our businesses can do to give us better access to those critical materials? Huh? Figure out how to make them here or develop those resources here. Who are we talking about? Lithium or what, what do we need? Silicon? It's weird that we wanted to do that. We designed it and then sent it over there. There's probably like a really expensive we don't manufacturing company. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is why smart people are important, people. You guys need to figure this out. Okay? I can't figure this out. You are the brains. Yes. Are we, like, all the things that we get from China, mm -hmm. do we need to get them from China, or can we get them from somewhere else? So a lot of them are American companies. You understand? But so we develop China. the technology, and then we take it over there to build it. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. They also send us a check. Huh? They also send us a check. Oh, they're very good at stealing our intellectual property. They don't care what a copyright. You understand? It's the Communist Party of China. No, yeah. Because the companies that are American-based that are allowed to move over there. Oh yeah. So what do you do? How do you how do you make money on that? You buy stocks in those companies that are using cheap labor, in some cases slave labor, in China to produce cheap stuff that we can buy back from them. Um, and uh, you buy stock in the company. And the shares keep going up because they're making big profits on the cheap labor and slave labor in China. Yeah, let's go. Who cares about human rights? Right? Capitalism. Oh, yeah. What were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean... Okay, so protectionism, where you do keep a lot of these jobs here. And that's something Trump really tried to do, too. He lowered the, the uh, tax on manufacturing in this country, on corporate, in, corporate income tax, lowered it. Because if American businesses say, look, okay, taxes are lower here, then I can keep my business here and still make a profit. Yes, I have to pay my employees more because we're in the United States, but because the taxes are lower, I can make a living here. I can do business here. That's what Trump was trying to do, okay? And I don't know, is there anything wrong with that? 
I kind of like that idea. I heard a guy run for president, Rick Santorum, once said, zero tax on manufacturing. If you're going to stay in this country and be a manufacturer, we will not tax you because you are going to create jobs. And when you create all those manufacturing jobs, they're usually good paying jobs, at least middle class. And what you're going to create is a bunch of new taxpayers. So even though the company's not paying taxes, you have all the people that work there that are making money and paying taxes, which brings in revenue to the government. I love that. That we're that what we're getting, yeah, right now, like with the government compared to oh the yeah oh I see I see I don't know if it's a smaller piece. I mean, in some cases you could get more revenue from people paying income taxes than you would from a twenty eight percent corporate tax. You know what I mean? If if they if Cessna uh, hires five thousand employees, probably gonna, you could probably get more money from those five thousand employees than one Cessna. Paying taxes, okay, and we do that here in Wichita. Like we'll tell Cessna, if you want to build a new factory, we won't make you pay property taxes for ten years on that property because you're going to bring in revenue just by hiring new employees. And we're like, yeah, let's do that. Some people don't like that. They think, well, the corporations are the greedy corporations, right? And they make all this money and treat people bad. Like, oh my God, these are the people that are providing wealth for people and giving them good sustenance. You know, they can raise family and buy houses. And do nice what they're evil because they they're corporate I, come on yeah uh, how would you decide like which ones i would say all of them i mean to be, make it fair because you say okay steel manufacturers pay no taxes but um if you manufacture automobiles you pay taxes i don't know if that's fair um I mean, or you just try it for a few years and see how it goes. You know? Yeah. Do you think that if you say, like, no tax on manufacturers, would the American manufacturers in China? You know, that's what Trump was kind of hoping would happen. That's called repatriating money or businesses back to the United States. I think he had pointed out some examples of com companies that decided not to go overseas because of the tax cut. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of will to do it. Um, I, I'm not being, I'm, I'm being biased here when I say this. I really like that idea. You know what I mean? Because there was once a country called Spain. Spain came over to the New World and went into Central and South America and found all this gold and took it from the people that lived here. They took it back to Spain and they had all this money. So their neighbors built stuff for the Spaniards, and the Spaniards had all this gold to buy the stuff that people were selling them. And then when Spain ran out of gold, they ceased to be relevant. We don't, if we don't make anything here as a society, I mean, can we, I mean, this is a real concern. Like, do, can we make the airplane parts that we need? I mean, Congress had to pass a law that said, Critical airplane parts for our military aircraft cannot be made in China. They're a potential enemy. Should we be allowing them to make the stuff that we really need to survive as a nation economically? You know what I mean? But it's all about the fast buck. And so, you know, it takes courage to stand up to that kind of money. Because we are talking, guys, these corporations are bringing it in. Now, the only way for you to get in on that is to buy stocks in these companies that are making so many profits off of cheap labor in other countries. Okay. Now, that cheap labor in Mexico, does it help the people of Mexico? No, seriously, if there's a Ford motor plant there and they're paying somebody in Mexico, you know, $8 an hour, where in Detroit they were making $48 an hour. How's $8 an hour in Mexico? Is that pretty good? Yeah. Better than that. It's better than what most people can get. So one thing, you know, we talked about was helping other countries by, you know, sending industry down there. And by virtue, it helps the consumer here. That's free trade, baby. It's free trade. Okay. And we really went to it in the 90s. 
and uh, they passed what was called NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Okay, and so basically there were no ta tariffs or restrictions on imports between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Okay, and uh, the idea is that would help our neighbors uh, and help us. Okay, it devastated our Rust Belt. Okay, you hear Trump talk about it all the time, talk about how awful of a, how awful it was for us. It was good for them. It was awful for us. Okay. And I know a lot of times the man is full of hot air, but he is a businessman, and he, you know, he's seen this sort of thing before, and a tough negotiator. You know what I mean? So uh, I thought economically, as far as trade went, I was willing to give Trump the benefit of the doubt to try this with China, uh, because, like I said, we are the ones that built that, and so it's kind of interesting. So protectionism or free trade? All right, and it's it's a tough one because as as we'll get into here, guys, this goes gets much worse. All right, I know. Am I out of time? Oh god. All right. Well, I thought we learned something today. I did too, right? The government gets to keep that. 